Welcome everyone to the game speak with Clay. Looking for a redirect, but loose in front of the goal. Does anything in particular stand out? Is there any? the end zone for the touchdown. This is Bernie Corbett saying, play the game well. Welcome everyone to episode eight, season one, episode eight of the games people play with Bernie Corbett. I'm Bernie Corbett. Pleased to be with you here this afternoon from our home. Uh, this has uh, become our uh, regular haunt, and uh, that is the Fours Sports Bar and Restaurant, Canal Street here in Boston, hard by the TD Garden. And of course, the Fours voted the number one by Sports Illustrated, not just me, sports bar and restaurant in the nation. And if you're in Boston, please stop by, you'll thank me and also takeout menu available. Uh, also, uh, here at the outset, I want to uh, thank our supporter, Phil Castanetti from Sports World, one of the largest sports memorabilia shop since 1986, 87 Broadway, Route 1 in Saugus. For all your sports memorabilia wants, needs, or desires, check in with our good friend, Phil Castanetti. Tell him the games people play session. And uh, also, uh, we want to uh, thank our good friend and supporter, Kirsten Kelly, from Kirsten Kelly and her sports and consulting. And uh, we want to thank Kirsten and uh, remind everybody if uh, you need a pro athlete, former or current, for a personal appearance, sales presentation, trade show, or corporate appearance, give Kelly Sports and Consulting a call. You can call Kirsten at 781 888 2791, or you can check Kirsten Kelly out on Facebook at Kelly Sports and Consulting. Once again, great to be back here at the Fours and uh, great to be joined by our guest on the games people play here today. Uh, the term renaissance man, I think it's uh, maybe thrown around uh, rather loosely. Uh, of course, the definition uh, by Webster's, I always consult with Webster when in doubt, a very clever person who is good at many things. Well, I think our guest today qualifies. Athlete, journalist, attorney, businessman, sports broadcaster at one time, and uh, also a musician. Andy happened to, uh, Andy, I think noted, uh, also uh, as uh, adept at the piano. So we're going to put musician in there uh, to complete the circle for Renaissance Man. Our guest is Gene Fugit, a former National Football League tight end for the Dallas Cowboys and the Washington Redskins, Super Bowl champion. And uh, once again, as we're going to talk to here in the games people play, uh, I believe defines renaissance man. Gene, welcome. Glad you can play with us here today on the games people play. All right. Thank you, Bernie. I, I appreciate that. And uh, being in Boston, uh, that's a state that's uh, close to my heart. Well, in, in, indeed. Well, you know, uh, we're going to get into that in, in a moment, but uh, uh, you were just down the Mass Pike where you intended uh, college, so uh, you almost got a little closer to where we are now, but that's part of the story. But uh, the beginnings of your story uh, in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, West Baltimore, and uh, attended Cardinal Gibbons High School, uh, skipped a couple of grades along the way, we might add, and uh, had the uh, distinction of being the first African-American athlete to be uh, the uh, Baltimore Catholic Athlete of the Year, uh, competing uh, all around uh, athletic uh, prowess uh, that you displayed at that time. And I uh, had an opportunity uh, to attend college uh, with uh, your athletic and academic ability that you demonstrated. And uh, well, when I said you might have ended up a little closer, I know that uh, the school across the river in Cambridge had some interest in you with, uh, with Harvard, but you decided to uh, travel a little bit further down the Mass Pike from where I am to uh, Amherst, uh, Venerable Amherst College. Yeah, I was uh, very fortunate. Uh, I, uh, it was 1968, and uh, it was uh, a lot like it is now in terms of a lot of turmoil in the country. And I had visited Harvard when my brother was at the law school, and it kind of scared me because it was a big city. And when I went and saw Amherst College uh, in, in the Berkshires, it, I knew that it was the place for me. So I was very fortunate and uh, to be able to get there and, and graduate in four years. I just felt it was the best four years 
and there were so many courses I never got a chance to take. Two Sport All American, a uh, little All American at, uh, at Amherst, uh, 1971, and uh, graduated at 20. That's what happens when you skip a couple of grades. So uh, uh, you were very young, uh, leaving Amherst, and uh, had the opportunity of going to a smaller school to play both basketball and football. And uh, you came a little bit later to football than uh, basketball, Gene, in terms of uh, your athletic uh, interest in uh, pursuits early on. Well, I didn't play football until the 12th grade of high school, and I was destined to be an NBA player until I went to a Baltimore Bullet, now Wizard, training camp, and when Earl the Pearl Monroe walked past me, and he was taller than I was, that's when I knew I was not going to play in the NBA. But I still had basketball aspirations. I was one of the top players in the city and represented the city in those days. So you can imagine when I got to Amherst College, the reputation had somewhat preceded me. And I had started my broadcast career at the college radio station. So one night during my freshman basketball season, I get a telephone call from a UMass fan, UMass at Amherst. UMass, he calls me and he says, Fugit, you're going to get your comeuppance this week. And I said, really? Because in those days, you had freshman teams. And I said, well, why should I be worried? He says, we got a player from New York that's going to kill you. So I was beginning to get nervous. And I said, well, where in New York is he from? And he said, uh, oh, he's from Long Island. I said, Long Island? I'm not worried about anybody from Long Island. Where in Long Island? Roosevelt. Oh, I'm not worried about Roosevelt, Long Island. And he said, what's his name? And I said, he said, Julius Irvin. And I said, do you think I'm worried about some Jewish kid from Long Island? Well, hey, I'm from West Baltimore. Later, I'm not worried. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't worried at all until four <laughs> days later when he came out and put about 30 some points on me. <laughs> we was, became good friends uh, after that. And we used to play pickup all the time. And he often invited me up to Philadelphia. And boy, those were some days when he was in the 76ers. We, we won and only. The inimitable Dr. J. Quite an introduction. You got, you got, you got the hard introduction to Dr. J on the hardwood on the court, <laughs> up close and personal. Yeah, <laughs> it, it did. It, uh, a, a major influence uh, on you, and uh, well, on literally generations of football players and the game beyond, was your coach at, at Amherst, a true icon of the sport. Just to Tell us a little bit, uh, a little bit of perspective as a player, what it was like to play for Red Jim Austin Dark. Well, we had uh, a coaching staff at Amherst. Uh, Coach Austin Darp, you know, was from uh, Baltimore. And I was actually uh, recruited by Tracy Mayer, who just passed away just recently. Tracy won, I think, your uh, Massachusetts Amateur Golf Championship. And uh, he was a Marine vet. He had coached at Boston College, and uh, he had one eye. And he would go with three clubs and play 19 holes, I mean 18 holes. He was just such an incredible man and influence on my life that I have to give a tribute to uh, Tracy Mayer, who coached at uh, Georgetown Prep in D.C., Loyola High School in Baltimore, Boston College, and then finished his career as a coach at Amherst College, and he was my offensive coach. And this was the man that made me stay after practice against my will, running up and down the hill. I mean, his daughters used to plead for him to give me a break. He would come by on Sunday and hit me in the head with the Bible because my mother told him to take care of me. See, my mother had a motto that she never sent us anywhere. She always took us. And how she met the freshman dean, I'll never know. Because my freshman year at Amherst, I'm 16, first time away from home. I get a call from the freshman dean, and he said that I took that lecture too seriously. And I said, which one? He said, the lecture that says you'll learn more outside the classroom than in. You still have to go to class. <laughs> and then he threatened to call my mother. 
I didn't miss any more classes uh, that semester. And uh, the fact that uh, Tracy cared so much because he didn't have to stay after practice. He was a full tenure professor. He could have gone home. But, no, he's out uh, working with me. And then Coach Ostendar to uh, be able to take it during a time of turmoil when everybody wasn't uh, getting along, especially in terms of racial harmony and social harmony. And he was able to bring us all together and uh, become a common denominator. You know, Amherst College, I mean, I think the way I ended up with the Cowboys is that the fact that he knew Tom Landry and they played together on the New York Giants. Uh, he was a punt returner uh, four times. But there's a famous story, uh, Bernie, that you're going to love, is that University of Massachusetts got a computer, mainframe, and they were looking for people to use it. So they called over to Amherst College. Do you have, we have some computer time. Do you have some guys that want to use this mainframe? So what they did is they developed a football scouting program where they broke down the game films. And what they ended up was a printout that showed you a line of scrimmage and then showed you the tendencies by down and distance. This program ended up in Dallas, used by the Dallas Cowboys. And I didn't even know about it. Hmm. And because the Cowboys were the first to use this uh, uh, computer scouting. So as the story goes, there was a tie game between Amherst and Williams the year that they used this. And the left tackle for Williams was the former secretary of education named William Bennett. They come up, it was uh, third uh, and, and, and one. They called timeout. They called the play. They come out. And as soon as they got in formation, the Amherst linebacker calls out the play. And Bennett stands up out of formation and says, how did they know? <laughs> so we go on to win that game. We like to beat Williams. I just had to mention that since you're in Massachusetts. But, yes. Uh, that the program great rivalries. Enough, ended up uh, uh, being used by the Dallas Cowboys, and that got there before I did, I think. <laughs> with Gil Brandt and the, of course, they were uh, pioneering cutting edge for so many years with such great success with their scouting. And uh, also, one other uh, note about your recruiting, uh, school down the road from uh, Baltimore, uh, down in uh, Virginia, William and Mary was looking to recruit uh, their first African-American player and uh, a couple of coaching legends that were there at the time with Bobby Ross and Lou Holtz. And uh, apparently it's between you and uh, a gentleman that has gained some notoriety in the world of uh, politics with the, the, the two guys that they were looking at at the time. Boy, that was an amazing time now that I look back on that. And thanks uh, for that research and, and the memory. But, yes, uh, Coach Bobby Ross, who went on to become the head coach of the University of Maryland and I think Georgia Tech, yes, Georgia uh, Tech. was in uh, my mother's kitchen, offered me the opportunity to be the first black player and, uh, at, uh, at William & Mary. And Coach Lou Holtz was the head coach. It was on the staff. And I respectfully declined and went as far north as I could to an abolitionist school. <laughs> That's right, and and the and the other guy that they were talking to uh, became the mayor of Baltimore, I believe. Yeah, Church, Church Smoke, who went on to Yale and uh, mm. and uh, law school as well at Harvard. Mm. And another uh, friend that you made back uh, in uh, in Baltimore in the high school ranks of note, uh, he headed to the Midwest to South Bend. Uh, was uh, me being a Notre Dame football fan, I know it was Tom Gateway. Well. If you Tom was the one that really introduced me to football training and the position of tight end. He uh, lived uh, two blocks away from me, and I didn't even know him. You know, in those days, once you got off your block, he only played against people. He didn't really know who they were, but he was already a legend. And he was a legend at a legendary school playing for a legendary coach, George Young. Now, this is the same George Young that's in the mm -hmm. NFL Hall of Fame who ended up being general manager of the New York football giants. Well, he was a high school coach at one of our best public schools in Baltimore called Baltimore City College. And Kurt Smoke was a quarterback. Tom Gatewood was the tight end. 
so uh, my coach, Bob Patchwall, knew George Young, and they suggested that the two of us get together. And I trained with Tom all summer. And it was great and a great relationship where I promised I would let law school know about him and he used to be in the NFL we know about me. Recently, his career uh, ended because of that accident that he was with Cliff Brown. And as a, uh, a New York Giants uh, longtime season ticket holder, thank goodness for George Young, that's all I can say, because he was instrumental in, in turning the Giants program around. Uh, been well, Bernie, several years you know the kind of guy George Young was, okay? I I'm glad that you reminded me of this. It was about a week before I'm going to Dow Cowboy training camp. Now, you got to remember, I'm, I'm – uh, how old was I? I'm 20 years old. I had played – Eight games a season, you know, I've never been hit, <laughs> you know, no spring football, you know. so here I am going to Dallas Cowboy camp, the phone rings, you know, you got one phone in the house, gee, somebody's on the phone for you, and it was, uh, George Young was on the phone, he had never called me, hmm. and I took the phone, I said, hi coach, how are you, he said, phew, you know you don't know how to block. When you get down there in the Oklahoma drill, just go hard and make a lot of noise, and Tom will teach you. <laughs> I said, Tom, Tom who? And he said, Tom Landry, good luck. Boom, and he hung up on me. <laughs> Isn't that something that he would call me? He said, week before I went to camp. I'll never forget that, George Young. I was, I was so proud of that. He called me, good luck, you know, and make a lot of noise. And, you know, and I, learned, I learned everything the hard way, but fortunately, I learned it so it never happened more than once. Because, you know, one time I caught a pass over the middle, I didn't know what to do. And the coach says, look for the smallest guy and run right at him. <laughs> <laughs> Sound advice. <laughs> That'll carry a long way. No <laughs> doubt. No doubt. <laughs> Good advice. It, it, indeed. And once again, extraordinary, I think, to note uh, to uh, maybe uh, uh, viewers, listeners and viewers of a certain age, the NFL draft was a lot deeper at that time. You're coming out of college, once again, 20 in, 19, uh, in 1972. And uh, 13th round, you were drafted at that time, the draft, you were drafted the 358th selection in the 13th round by the Dallas Cowboys. Now there's cameras for the top draft picks in the first few rounds. There's house parties with uh, viewing on ESPN for that moment. What about the moment when you found out, Mr. Fugit, that you had been drafted in the 13th round by the Dallas Cowboys? Where were you at that moment? We didn't have VSPN. We didn't have the internet. Okay, all we had was the AP Newswire. <laughs> and that was it. I don't even know. I didn't have a cell phone. I don't even know how he found the phone number where I was living because it was with a dorm. <laughs> they actually had the number to the dorm. Now the first day, of course, you know how you have the haters, and some of these people went on to be famous. So I won't say any names, even though some of them were even in the media today, but we're all good friends. But they were teasing me like you wouldn't believe because it was the first day of the draft and nothing happened. Well, somehow they found my number and the second day Gilbrand called and boy, my feet weren't on the ground for a week. <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty good week. Pretty good week. And, and a chance that, you know, you not only have a chance to go to the NFL, and of course, you know, by definition, you're going to be the youngest. If you make the team, you're going to be the youngest player in the NFL. You're only 20 years old. But it was the Dallas Cowboys. What was what were your feelings at the time? Were you a big Colt fan growing up in Baltimore? I mean, what, did you have, you know, the, the Cowboys are a team that not many people are neutral about, Gene. So how were you going into that experience? Well, Brian, it was hard. I mean, it was really hard because – I was a Colt fan. My mother and father had Colt season tickets. 
Mm. I mean, they had season tickets for so long that they had free tickets for the kids. So we got to go to the games. My father was at the 58 championship game. Ah, and my mother okay. likes to tell the story about here we have six kids in the family. My mom and dad both work in one or two jobs, both. And my father goes and gets Colts season tickets. And my mother, she said, was not excited about it. So she called her mother complaining. And my grandmother asked my mother, how many tickets did he buy, one or two? And she said two, and my grandmother hung up. <laughs> <laughs> so they became Colt fans, and I saw some of the greatest games of all time. Paul Horning kicking extra points. I mean, the Packers. And I'll give you a trivia question. The last game one season, you know, at the end of the season, everybody runs onto the field. And and this is the old days when they had the old flags and the old goalposts. So people were trying to get souvenirs. So they were Colts were playing the Redskins. I got a chin strap of a player who was in the Hall of Fame today. And would you believe that years later I was his teammate from the Redskins, and he was a running back at the time, can you name that re that player in the Hall of Fame? And of course, nobody can name it because it's Charlie Taylor. Charlie Taylor became a receiver. That's back. right. Yeah, that's and right. Snotted as a running back. Yep. Charlie Taylor Absolutely. tells one of the best, one of my favorite stories of all time. He talks about the time that they were at football practice at Arizona State, and this player jumped up and told Frank Cush, hey, sorry, Coach, I got to go. I got a baseball game. And Cush was livid. Frank Cush couldn't believe it. And he cursed the player out, called him everything, but the son of God said, don't ever come back. And that, of course, was Reggie Jackson. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you got a great story. <laughs> That's tremendous. You weren't going to be a two-sport guy with Frank Cush. With Frank Cush, and there's nothing leaving. That's right. He had a game. It's so funny. Frank Cush was the wrong guy to tell you your troubles to, or if you needed water during practice, you probably weren't going to get a cup. That's right. <laughs> That's it. Absolutely. Yeah, and, uh, Charlie, man, he, he was a great player, and he, he's, he's my hero. And uh, when his, my up. first year with the Redskins was my fifth year in the league, but I was a rookie all over again. And I jumped for a pass, and Charlie Taylor looked at me like I was crazy. He said, Fugit, didn't they teach you in Dallas that interceptions is a quarterback statistic? <laughs> oh, that's, no, that's of no concern of yours. <laughs> well, I, you know, right. they didn't teach you that. Yeah. Leave that to Kilmer and Jurgensen. Oh, exactly. Boy. Yeah. It <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was last touchdown pass. Ah, his la the last one of his career, illustrious yeah, career. Yeah, uh, that Billy was Kilmer. Great, that was a great achievement. That's why well, I love playing with him. You know, the very first game with Billy Kilmer, Harry Carson, you were Giants. Oh, yeah. And he, yep. he came right up the middle, and and Billy had that little one bar. He punched it one bar, right, yep. right in the nose. So I was downfield, and I'm one of the last people to come back, and nobody stopped to help him. And with Starback, all of us would be trying to get him back to the huddle because he would be knocked out, you know, or concussed. So I'm going over to help Kilmer, man. He cussed me out and told me to get my butt back to the huddle. I went in there, Len Hoss and the linemen were laughing at me. And they said, man, if you help him up, how hard are they going to come next time? That was my introduction to the <laughs> uh, Well, your, as far as your introduction to, to the Cowboys, I guess George Young was somewhat prophetic. The Cowboys, uh, with their uh, innovative uh, track that they were on from uh, from many many years before, way ahead of their time. Uh, they had guys over time that uh, maybe came from smaller schools, or in the case of a guy like a Cornell Green, came from another sport that they were able to make successful football players. What about your experience with Tom Landry being such a you know obviously low draft pick, uh, relatively low expectation? He saw something in you and uh, gave the opportunity to develop it. 
Well, I, I had two things I could learn, you know, so so I guess I was I was smart. So I had to be intelligent to play for the Dallas Cowboys. And number one, so because you had to learn that multiple offense. And just imagine yourself being on the offense and they call a play, cost 48 on two. And then you go to the line of scrimmage, then he goes 290. He just changed the play. 290. What am I supposed to do? And that's the only time you have to remember that. One year we played the Cardinals, and they were one of the best teams in the NFL. Don Coriel had a team that uh, were the best collection of players who didn't know odd from even or left from right. So they would be cut because they couldn't know the play. So George Allen, he would, if we were going to play the Rams next week and the Rams cut somebody, he would grab that guy, whoever he was, just to find out what they were doing. He would cut his mother just to find out the system. who yep. this guy was. So he did that. And one year we found out that the Cardinals uh, had to tell every receiver what to do. And therefore, they could not call audibles. Jim Hart. Coriel. No, they won with this team. That's why Coriel is one of the greatest coaches of all time. Yep. You yeah, know, if Coriel. a quarterback calls 30 and he turns around and the fullback runs a 31, bam, he runs into the quarterback. He's gone the next day. Well, the next day he's going to be at the Cardinals. <laughs> he can run. If he gets past the quarterback, this guy's going to run 80 yards. But he ran the wrong way. Oh, man, and there's so many guys like that. God bless them. They can really play, but just for some reason, they, just, they, just, they can't remember. Mm -hmm. Well, you could not be like that and be on the Cowboys. I mean, if you jumped offside in practice, you had to run penalty laps. Mm -hmm. So it was a unique experience to be in what I think was one of the most innovative football systems. I mean, to this day, Cowboy offense is advanced and does more than over half the offenses in the NFL today. Hmm. I mean, I had pre-snap reads as a receiver where, where we were one of the first teams to send somebody in motion just to find out if they were playing man-to-man. -man. I mean, how hard is that? But every hmm. team, for some reason, can't do that. Somebody's going to jump offside. Or, but just by sending somebody across the backfield, as simple as that, Bernie, to know it's man-to-man -man or zone. Well, I mean, how much is that worth before the ball snap? So these yeah. kinds of things, Landry Absolutely. often uh, gave us a, a, a big advantage. But one time, we couldn't take advantage of it, and he was so upset. And he says, I'm taking off my Super Bowl ring. And Leroy Jordan said, well, I'm aware of mine. <laughs> <laughs> the captain. The captain has spoken. But can you imagine you, you, you had Tom NFL, yep. trying to be a tight end, taking the plays yep. in and out with Mike Ditka? Mm. Yeah, I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. you, you, you had you had Mike Ditka, a Hall of Famer at the position, uh, mentoring you at the position. You also had a guy next to you. You had a Hall of Famer named Ray Field Wright that uh, I believe was uh, rather instrumental in. Well, going a little bit beyond what George Young told you in terms of blocking at that position. Oh, he sure did. And uh, he helped me uh, quite a bit, you know, with my footwork. He, I, they were trying to get me to dive at players. And he said, Fugit, don't get on the ground. But my favorite Rayfield Wright story is we were playing the Atlanta Falcons, and they had a pretty good defensive end named Claude Humphrey. Now, Rayfield was going for a season with no sacks. And this is like they're going against uh, uh, Deacon Jones, Claude Humphrey, uh, just the greatest defensive ends at the time, and he wants to have no sacks. So the Falcons are playing what they call an over defense, where uh, Humphrey would be over the tight end and the linebacker was inside. So on certain plays, I would have to block Humphrey, and he was afraid that I would miss. He would tackle Starback, and then he would be charged with the sack. So he said, Fugit, you have to stay out after practice and learn how to pass protect. So I said, okay, sounds. I'd like to learn how to do that. So all week, you know, and this is not a coach now. No coach showed me how to do this. They just told me to block them. But he said, you got to get back, get back, get back. 
So as fate would have it, I bring that play in. So because uh, me and Mike Dick are going in and out. Because the year before, Bernie, a lot of people don't remember this, that uh, Landry used shuttle quarterbacks. He had Craig right. Morton and Starback on Starbuck. every other play. Mm -hmm. And then he decided to go with Starback for the playoffs. And that's when the tight end shuttle started with Dick and Billy Truax. Truax got hurt the next year, and that's how I make the team. But anyway, that's a, a, another story. So anyway, mm -hmm. uh, Rayfield says, remember, figures. So I bring this one in. And sure enough, before I could get back, Humphrey came off with a head slap, and he hit me right on the star. And I had a ride bell suspension helmet. I didn't have pads in my helmet to the third season. I had a helmet that went like this. It would be great if I got turned upside down and dropped. That thing came up and hit me in my jaw. I get rocked back on one leg. Rayfield checks linebacker, catches me, puts me down, and then goes and blocks Big Claude Humphrey. It was unbelievable. <laughs> and I'm in there at all. So, of course, that next week, Tom Landry would have to feature that lack of a block by me and say, this is not how you pass protect. And he showed it so many times. The film burned up in the projector. Remember those days? <laughs> projector. And he said, don't worry, Fugit. He is coming, Fugit. Don't worry, Fugit. I got three more copies of that. <laughs> Run it back. <laughs> yeah, that was quite a lesson. But I never got hit slapped again. No, absolutely. Lesson learned. That's that's one you only have to be tested once. It, uh, <laughs> it never, it never, it never yeah, again. I asked Rayfield about it. I said, hey, what about the head slap? He yeah. said, oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. Oh, yeah, that's back. right. Put yeah. your hand in. That was just the one technique. When you get it back, get your hand up. So you. That was an important was detail to, to leave out, even for a Hall of Famer. Absolutely. At, uh, at that time with the Cowboys, and I want you to know, one of our missions uh, that we, uh, we certainly uh, aspire to here on the games people play, we want to make the guests feel at home. So I am wearing my Roger Starbuck. Yeah, I noticed you had number 12 you know, on Yep, that's absolutely, and uh, and if there was any video evidence of that of this being a diehard Giants fan, I mean, speaking of burning, we'll have to we'll have to burn the tape. Oh, but I wanted to make you feel at home. I'm throwing the questions. I'm not throwing the Duke at you, but I'm throwing the questions at you today, Gene. Oh, I want to make man. you feel at home. You know, one of my favorite, uh, I got a couple of favorite Giants stories. Uh, my first one is uh, my big nemesis was Brad Van Pelt. Oh yes. Oh, my yep. God. He used to beat me up like you wouldn't believe. And I told my brother one year, I said, Tony, I'm going to get him this year. I'm going to get him. You watch first play of the game, man. I'm going to jaw jack him. And sure enough, I came off the line, and it was the year I was going to be a free agent. So I was known up till then as a finesse blocker. But my last year, I went savage. I went animal. I came off the ball and hit him. He was so surprised. And my brother said, in the stands, he went, ooh. Well, the next play, he, he slammed me behind the net and flattened me on the ground, and the battle was joined. So I love that guy, but I uh, never really got to talk to him, but we played very hard twice a year. And mm. then the, the beauty of playing against the Giants, the very first year, Bernie, we were in Yankee Stadium. Oh, that's right, they before the Giants moved, start. yeah. And they said, Fugit, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the Bay Road Trophy. Where do you think I'm going? That's right. Want to go to the monuments. Yeah. Yes. So to be just from Baltimore to be in the Yankee style. Oh, my God. So then the next year, we're at the Yale Bowl. Mm. Then right. the year after that, we're at Shea Stadium. Mm. And then finally, the Meadowlands opened. And the first year the Meadowlands opened, the crown of the field was so bad that they had to fix it. So when you ran a down and out from the other hash, the ball sailed. I said, Sides, when your ball sailed, it got thrown the same way. And you could see that I was actually running downhill. And they had to, you check that, they had to fix it after the season. Meadowlands. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. He was, I believe he was in the south end zone. I think that was oh, his, per, okay. his, his permanent resting place. So so goes the uh, the rumors over the last uh, 40 years. And the first year he went to the Meadowlands, the players were so mad because the girlfriends couldn't find him. <laughs> you know, we used to be up at 9 West 57th, you know, on the Central Park West. Yeah. Next thing you know, we're out, so I, was, man, I don't know where we stayed. <laughs> out, in the, out in the weeds of Secaucus. Yeah. Yes. 
it's yeah. not, not, not quite the same as the bright lights of the city. No, it's it uh, not the same road trip as going to Yankee no. Stadium. No, no indeed. That, but that was a trip I'll never forget, man. I mean, I mean, I wasn't even focusing on the game. I'm just soaking up Yankee Stadium. Y- Yankee Stadium. It's embarrassing, actually. I should have been more focused on the game. <laughs> Big time. Well, you- well, being from Baltimore and, uh, and and the roots of Babe Ruth back to Baltimore, you're excused. Okay. I think that was uh, to, to have the stars in your eyes. They're the, the, the greatest of them all. A guy that I got to bring up, and uh, I know that you've, you've talked about, uh, and I guess really maybe still fascinated by, was Dwayne Thomas, your teammate. And uh, you've got a little bit of a an education beyond football with Dwayne, his behavior, and maybe – the explanation for his behavior at, at the time. Well, Dwayne was uh, from Texas, and uh, you know I, I met him uh, in training camp, but I, I didn't really know him at first. And somehow I survived. There were a hundred uh, players that year, hundred degrees, about uh, fifty of them get cut. I made that first cut, and then the world champions come in. Then it's another hundred. So I was out there one day circling the goalpost. And Cornell Green was the first veteran to talk to me. He said, Fugit, I know what you're doing. You're not going to find any shade out here. And sure enough, I was going around the goalposts trying to get some shade. I mean, just two degrees difference would make a difference of one play or something. I mean, I'm just trying to get any extra edge I can. So uh, he, he talked to me. I said, why did not let the water boy sit in that helmet down there? And he said, darn, Fugit, that ain't no water boy. That's Dwayne Thomas, and he's on strike. <laughs> he was on strike, right. <laughs> so he, I got to watch that the adventure of uh, coaches and players coming up trying to get him to come to practice. And then finally, of course, he was traded to San Diego, and then later we would read meet on the Redskins. But I tell you, man, he was uh, – really inspirational because, of course, he was a Hall of Fame-type running back who went a whole season without talking to the media. And I think because of him, they have that clause in the contract now where we must cooperate with the media because they could not make him give an interview. And the first uh, word he said was evidently after Brookshire said that he was really fast or something. You know, That's right. Was, Evidently. That's yeah, evidently. Yeah, evidently. You never forget that. And then, and then next year, I'm there. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, I had no idea, uh, you know, what was going to be happening. But he uh, was from Greenville, Texas, which is a town 30, about 30 miles east of Dallas. And uh, Abner Haynes, who belongs to the Hall of Fame, and was my good friend, leader, and agent at the time, said, I'll – tell you why he has such an attitude. He called Tom Landry a plastic man, and he was one of the first to point out the racist tendencies that were occurring. You know, during those 70s, everything was starting to change. And I was uh, one of the first uh, black cowboys to even be able to live in North Dallas in 1972. That was the first year that any cowboy, had, black cowboy had ever lived in North Dallas. Cowboys couldn't buy the houses of their choice I mean, Willie uh, Pride, okay, the country western singer? Yes, Charlie Pride. Charlie Pride. Charlie Pride. Oh, Charlie man, Pride. A great, great man. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I said, Charlie, how come the first three albums, you're not even on the album cover? And he said, Great Asian. He would show up at concerts and people didn't believe it was him. We want the real Charlie Pride. <laughs> it was a changing time, you know. I mean, look, at our Super Bowl party, I was so upset, man. I said, how can we lose to a dirty, grimy city like Pittsburgh? And then somebody wrote me a letter and said, Figure, aren't you from Baltimore? I had to write back, touche. And I said, well, at least we had a better party. We had Willie Nelson. Who did you have? You know. <laughs> we lost that game. Every year we lose that game, bro. It comes on highlights. And every year, Mark Washington tips the ball, and every year, uh, Lynn Swan catches the darn thing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, every year we knock Terry Bradshaw out. Yeah, yeah. And we lose. How do we lose a game like that? How, how could how could that happen? And particularly painful during this pandemic with all the you know, the sports reruns. That's one that's been over and over again the last few months. Tough to avoid. Oh, 
Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Well. Yeah. It's an NFL network with all the old Super Bowl uh, highlight, right. uh, highlight reels, you know. It, oh, uh, man. Well, I get to relive it once a year. We lose every year. It's like Groundhog Day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Same result. Yeah. You know, there was another guy uh, that was in, in the backfield at the time. And uh, he had uh, a Yale-educated Yale edu uh, young man. Uh, he was Rookie of the Year in the NFL in 1969, Calvin Hill. And uh, Calvin was instrumental in another turn in your career. And uh, that was uh, your exposure and, uh, and what turned out to be extensive experience in NFL labor relations and becoming the player rep. Was, was becoming the player rep, Gene, was it one of those situations where – uh, take one step forward and everybody took one step backward and you became the player rep for the Cowboys? Yeah, it, it, it was pretty much it. I mean, it, it was an opportunity and I was young and naive and wanted to serve and had no idea. Now, my father had told me, look, don't be afraid to volunteer, just don't be first. And I didn't think I was being first, but I ended up, you know, that I was. And I didn't know that uh, I would end up in 1974 during the No Freedom, No Football strike. On one day, I was the only ticket outside the Dallas Cowboy camp. Wow. And can you wow. imagine standing there and having Charles Landry walk by and shake his head, text him calling me names, and Joe saying, come on, what are you doing? And Dicker asking me, what the hell am I doing? And Starbucks saying, come on, Fugi. I mean, you know, and I'm the only one. So I called Gene Upshaw because we were in Thousand Oaks, and they were up in San Rosalita somewhere. So the next day, it was Fugit and the Oakland Raiders picketing the Cowboy game. Can you imagine? <laughs> Somebody said, you'll never play in this league again. So that was almost true. So I show up at training camp my last year there, and Landry said that uh, they decided to go with Billy Joe Dupree at tight end. So he could release me, cut me, trade me, or I could compete with Golden Riches at wide receiver. All great options. <laughs> and it, as it turns out, there was, well, it turned out there was, uh, there was a loophole for you, if, if you will. Uh, it was subsequent to, to the free agency. But uh, you became uh, a starter the next year. You mentioned Dupree. He was the number one draft pick out of Michigan State in 74. But things happen in the NFL. There's twists and turns of fate. And uh, you ended up as the starter once again in 1975 and, and had one of your best years. Yeah. Well, that was the year that, uh, you know, I was challenged because, again, I had uh, unsuccessfully led the strike. I was a troublemaker, clubhouse lawyer, and they had decided to go with Dupree. And I had, yeah, we, we played double tight end, but I didn't always split out. So that was the idea. I'd be cut and I'd be a malcontent and a tweener. In other words, not big enough for tight end and not good enough for wide receiver. But they didn't know <laughs> that I did have some talent, a lot of training, a lot of help. Otto Stowe uh, gave me the Paul Warfield workout. Uh, Roger Starback stuck with me. Uh, Drew Pearson stuck with me. And I had speed. I was a big guy and uh, really wanted it. And they gave me the opportunity. And I just, every chance I had, I, I just took the opportunity. Yeah, 30, uh, 38 catches that year, 488 yards, three touchdowns, and uh, the opportunity, well, once again, Super Bowl 10, uh, and uh, had the opportunity to play against the, uh, the Steelers uh, in that, uh, that memorable, one of the, uh, the all-time classics of the game. I, I got to ask you once again, as uh, we had up on the screen, you're scoring a touchdown. Of course, a touchdown against the Giants. There was a lot of that going on in the 70s against the Giants. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, there was... I, I noted something in my research about uh, there was one game in particular that said it was, and you referenced it as, well, you know, it was a team that we really couldn't get up for. So, you know, the statute of limitations is up. Was the Giants a team that maybe you couldn't get up for because it was automatically going to be two wins almost every year? Well, look, this, this goes all the way back to Bob Hayes versus Spider Locker. Yeah. Remember those days? Oh, absolutely, yeah. See, and and uh, Tom, it was a big game for Tom Larry because yeah. he plays for the Giants. He's a giant, yeah. And he was an assistant coach for what many will tell you was the greatest team of all time. That's so right. the Colts beat them. They were the greatest team that the NFL had ever seen. That was a great team. 
Yep. I mean, I'm sitting there telling you it was a great thing. And I love that picture in, in the book with all three coaches. Jim Lombardi and Landry Lombardi and Jim Lee Howell. Yeah. So that's why him and the Packers was always a big deal. So they say uh, uh, Robinson tells the story that when they called time out in the ice bowl, that Lombardi said, and make a long story short, he said, I was right then and I'm right now and we're going for it. Because he wanted the Giants to go for it, but Landry told him to punt, the defense will stop him, and we'll kick a field goal and win. And, of course, the defense didn't stop Johnny United. Hmm. So Lombardi in the ice bowl against the Cowboys, <laughs> he said, I was right then, and I'm right now, and he told Bart Starr to go for it. Isn't that a great story? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, run the play and get us the hell out of here, right? I think that's what he said. It might have 16 Jethro degrees. Said they cheated, though. Jethro P said they cheated. He said they cheated. They pushed yeah, it. I had both sides of the story. I said, Jethro, yep. what happened, man? I mean, I mean, they were digging holes and stuff. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> he said they cheated. The Packers were cheating yeah, on that play. They sure. Yep. yep. They gave him a little push. <laughs> yep, they gave Star a little push. Chuck Racine gave him a little push. Another Yale guy, as a matter of fact. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It, uh, Great well, memory. Gotta, it, no, it, it, indeed. And I've got to ask you, was a, a piece that I read recently, one of my uh, favorite movies, you know, the genre of sports movies that kind of hit or miss, but I've got a few favorites. And uh, one of my favorites, and I, you know, I remember seeing it at the time. I was, I was very young when I saw it, when it first came out. It was the 40th anniversary was why there was an article was North Dallas 40, uh, based on Pete Gent's book. And uh, you lived North Dallas 40, if you will. How accurate was the movie? The movie at the time was almost, you know, it was kind of the equivalent of what Ball Ford did to baseball in terms of exposing some of the things that were happening behind the scenes in the NFL the general public didn't know. You were very young. You were with the Cowboys, your introduction to the NFL. Somewhat accurate as far as uh, the hijinks in that movie and, and some of the deeper issues. Well, as far as the hijinks, yeah, the first advice you, that, that uh, the rookies that they liked, the first advice you got was uh, it, when, you, when you shampoo your hair, don't close your eyes. <laughs> okay. So, so there was danger just in well, the shower, let alone in the locker room. I mean, the locker room was so crazy. I'll never forget in 1972, one day I walk in and there's a line of tape down the middle of the aisle. And on one side was Nixon and on the other side was McCuff. And you had to walk down one aisle or another. Can you imagine? Of course, Roger Starback was leading the Republicans for Nixon and all this stuff. So here I am. I want to get passes. I mean, a quarterback can decide who he's going to throw to. <laughs> That's right. Oh, I used to wash through Fosman's car. But anyway, that's another, you know. That's another, <laughs> that's another story. Throw me the ball. <laughs> you got to be nice to the quarterbacks. I, right. I, well, it was, yeah, indeed. It, it, well, I got the Starbuck jersey on it. And I, I will say, because of the dynamic in my home life, uh, my brother, my late brother was a Cowboy fan. And uh, he used to torment his older brother and, and his dad uh, about the Cowboys and the Giants, and it was pretty easy. It was almost like uh, the rivalry between a hammer and a nail uh, at that time, the Cowboys and the Giants. But uh, Roger Starbuck, uh, as, as someone that obviously some intimate knowledge of Roger Starbuck, uh, uh, iconic NFL figure, your, your memories of him, what immediately comes to mind when you think of uh, Roger Starbuck, the player, the field general, and Roger Starbuck, the man? Well, uh, as as a player, he, he would he would never give up, and and as a man, you know he had all the the virtues that you would want in a, a teammate, a, a father, a son, a brother. I mean, he was always there for you, and he would not get up. I mean, I was there today the when Clint Longley challenged him, and he lifted a hundred, and Clint Longley lifted a hundred and five. And he lifted 110, and Clint Long lifted 115, and Roger lifted 120, and then Roger got up, and then Clint Longley cold cocked him, hit him right in the jaw, and that was the last we saw Clint Longley. Now you know Clint was the famous quarterback that upset the Redskins at Thanksgiving Day, but 
Roger was a competitor, and this is a guy who had been to Vietnam, for Christ's sake. So come on. <laughs> no, that, that extraordinary figure, and uh, you think back, you had the opportunity, obviously, to play with them and, and uh, to, uh, to be on the receiving Yeah, end, and then uh, to Roger. have a guy believe yeah. in you, to have a guy that, that, that would throw the ball to you. Look, that's, I mean, like I said, every pass, he had three or four options. Yep. And he could run it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And he could run. He could tuck it and run. Yeah, he could run it. So, uh, no, it was it was it was a privilege and an honor. You had the op the opportunity to move on. 1976 it was a little bit of uh, the Roselle rule. It was you know once again you were steeped in the in the labor relations at the time, and uh, there was a, kind of a loophole that existed at that time that allowed you to move on. Yeah, Washington we had a court Redskins. case, and uh, they said they couldn't do a reserve clause like baseball used to have. So in my fourth season, I had originally had a three-year contract, and then the fourth contract, I had to take a 10% pay cut. So I made $20,000 for 20 games that year. I made more in playoff money. So I went from being the lowest paid tight end in the game to the highest paid tight end in the game the next year. And uh, me and Dan Fouts were the only players in the NFL – with no cut absolute contracts. Hmm. Wow. That, that was, George uh, Allen, God was, bless him. Yes. And of course, you know, George. Lewis working on the negotiations said he was sick of it. And I said, why? He says, every time I asked for something, he said, yes. But the crowning moment was to take <laughs> my mom and dad to Washington, D.C., into the office of Williams and Connolly. And we're sitting in Edward Bennett Williams' and Bennett Williams. And there's wow. the pictures of him with all the presidents and great people. Wow. And then to go in there with my mom and dad and him, and for him to sit there and said, you, you got to take something away from this game. I want to make sure you go to law school. This game can end at any time. It's a business, and you have to take something away from it. And my mother can quote that to this day. And I mean, just to be there with your mom and dad, Bernie, it, it was something. And she was so happy, and I was happy too. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Me and that guarantee contract, I was happy. Oh, oh. And no, no, course, no doubt. Know, and of course, I wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for, uh, I don't know, it, Mr. Williams or George Allen, but somebody called Ben Bradley at the Washington Post who called me and offered me a job. Hmm. So I was a news reporter at the Washington Post. Uh, in February and signed with the Redskins in May. And at that press conference, it's one of the most famous Redskins press conferences of all time because it was George Allen announcing the signing of Fugit, Calvin Hill, and John Riggins. And John Riggins, yeah. And he said, as long as you guys don't put the ball on the ground, defense and special teams will find a way to win. And we said, what? <laughs> <laughs> Don't screw it up. That's, That's right. right. Defense and special teams will find a way to win. <laughs> and once again, you followed that up. 1977, you had an all-pro season, uh, 36 catches, over 600 yards that year. Uh, a gaudy 17.5-yard average and, and five touchdowns and uh, really attained uh, some, some new heights with the Redskins and, and part of their program. You, you played, you talked about Tom Landry, that experience. Uh, George Allen, another iconic NFL figure, uh, famous with the Over the Hill Gang in Washington and the veterans that he'd be able to, uh, guys that some had been cast off from, from other teams. In your case, no, you were a young and free agent, but he'd pick up the older players and implement them into the system. What about playing for George Allen and, uh, and that experience and uh, the fact that you went from Landry to Allen, as it were, oh, icons right. in their own right? You know, I played for three Hall of Fame coaches. There's not many coaches in the Hall of Fame. And I played for three. Because one year, we had Sid Gilman at Dallas. That's right. Yeah. Oh, can you staff. He has the football degree I have. Wow. I got a that, PhD in football. A, 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 absolutely. That's you a doctorate. Sid Gilman, yep. Tom Landry at the drawing board defending and I mean the tape the chalk would be breaking and they would be doing each other oh no it was great that one season that that Sid was there then to go with uh, George Allen George because Allen, yeah. Tom was a technician and a, and a technocrat where George was a people person 
who understood uh, human and group dynamics. Tom had no idea about human <laughs> dynamics and, and group dynamics. But, uh, you know, 47 men together can never be defeated. See, George understood that. Tom right. never wouldn't understand that. Hmm. He would come at it a total different theoretical uh, way. Not to say it's a bad way. Either one is better than the other. But George Allen was just such a such a humanist, and uh, and he used those qualities. And he liked leaders. He had more former player reps on his team than any team in the NFL. And that's why it was such an honor to be elected by them to be a player rep also mm. in Washington. Mm. I mean, what an honor to have Ken Houston vote for me, mm. have Rick Owens vote for me. Come on, man. And then to be there when Bobby Mitchell was there, God bless him, he just passed away. And Charlie Mitchell, I mean, Bobby I'm Mitchell and Charlie Taylor, yep. Larry Brown, Billy Kilmer, Jerry Smith. Jerry Smith taught me the playbook. Was the tight end the guy you were trying to win his job? Yeah. That's right. That's yeah. the kind of man he was. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I was very fortunate, man. I mean, people have been coaches, like I said, Georgia. All these people contributed uh, to put me in a situation to be successful, and I was just very fortunate. I mean, to be sitting next to John Riggins for two seasons, how crazy was that? Our <laughs> blockers were right next to each other. Oh my God! One year, his dogs were eating my shoes up. <laughs> Never a dull moment there with, with John Riggins. Yeah, we, yeah. Oh, we had a lot of fun. Yeah. As, as we saw later on from John, it didn't matter who he was with, the common man or maybe a Supreme Court justice. He acted the same around everybody, Gene. <laughs> That's right. He was famous for that. It, 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 loosen up Sandy Baby, right? That, that's right. Loosen up Sandy Baby. There you go. Uh, the injury bug hit you late in your time in Washington. You had uh, uh, torn cartilage in the knee, operated. You came back uh, in 1978 and uh, played a prominent role with the Redskins, but uh, another knee injury and uh, eventually retirement after uh, giving it a go in 1979. You retired in 1980. But as you alluded to from uh, the hallowed offices of Edward Bennett Williams, you took heed in terms of life after football and the trade, the, the trade, I should say the signing going to Washington, it allowed you to go to GW law school and that opened up some new vistas for you to say the least. It sure did. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Dean Potts, a rest in peace, because uh, he had a, a quarterback uh, that also went through GW and Dean Potts uh, had been there that long and he said, and if I could get uh, him through, I can get you through. I'm trying to remember who it was. Who was that short quarterback that played with the Redskins? Eddie LeBaron? Yes. Mm -hmm. He said, if I can get Eddie LeBaron through, I can get you through. Isn't there something? <laughs> and I was amazing. so happy. And it was a great situation because it was one course a night, Monday to Thursday. And then the off season, I was still uh, working with the Redskins and then went into the TV after that. And you, you also mentioned another name, and you know, once again, in the spirit of Renaissance fan and uh, uh, spanning your career, uh, Ben Bradley of the Washington Post, and uh, you had uh, in one of the the many guises of Gene Fugit, uh, a news reporter, and uh, a news reporter at a couple of rather uh, prominent dailies, the Baltimore Sun and the Washington Post. Uh, just give us a little insight about that experience, what that meant to you and how that came about. <clears throat> well, I was always an avid reader and, and, and very curious. And, and I wanted to uh, be, be a journalist and I had no idea how far it would go. It started at Amherst College where I was the number two editor of the Amherst student for a season. And I really enjoyed it, having a chance to write editorials and to comment on you know things of the time, especially while you know being educated and uh, really having a chance to attack so many social issues from an intellectual point of view. And then I began to really understand that how key uh, journalism is. I mean, this whole fake news thing, I mean, come on. I mean, it, it is uh, uh, just as important as the government and, and, and everything else, because if we don't have information, we won't be able to do 
uh, very much. So I was fortunate to get an internship, and it resulted in being the first African American reporter to ever have a byline at the Baltimore Sun. And uh, the uh, uh, Mr. Paul Baker later decided that internet should have bylines, but the, the damage was already done. And there were so many stories to do since there were no African Americans. Now here's a newspaper that had uh, 12 foreign bureaus, but no African Americans in the local newsroom. So that, that's what it was like in 1970s, 1971. So uh, anyway, I was still very interested in that. So I go to the Cowboys. They had a weekly column in the Dallas Cowboy Weekly. So that's how I was able to continue writing. And I also had a radio show at KERAFM while I was in Dallas. Uh, it was a jazz program called Fly Time. So I was able to you know, keep my media stuff kind of going and, and, and the writing going. So I got the opportunity to go to the Washington Post. My career I knew was ended uh, at Dallas, and it was a great opportunity. I'm from Baltimore, and this was just a few years after Watergate. So, I mean, it was just, uh, it all came together, and I had a chance to be a news reporter. Well, you've had uh, many occupations that, uh, that you've excelled at. Um, agree or disagree with uh, the famous quotation from H.L. Mencken that was uh, was at the Baltimore, in the, uh, the lobby of the Baltimore Sun about the the honor of the profession and how the the esteem that he had for the profession that 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 he held with the Baltimore Sun the position that he had. Well, you know, he he, he was quite famous, although he was quite racist and quite profane. But uh, he was he was one of the popular writers at the time, and and that he helped to make uh, the Sun famous. But I was, went on to uh, Post Newsweek, which was quite a different story than the Sun editors. Because that was the uh, news post Newsweek company with uh, Catherine and Donald Graham, which is a big mm. difference. And uh, to this day, you know, the Washington Post uh, continues to excel in their field. But having a chance to, you know, to work there and to call anybody and and dare them to no comment, that was tantamount to saying that uh, <laughs> what you had asked them was true in those days. Right. 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 Chance to go into television. And uh, to be the first African American anchor, uh, there was a lot of pressure, you know, and people were wondering this. I was an athlete, and that was the only reason I got the job. And I wanted to be able to prove, you know, that I could be uh, professional hmm. and to encourage other athletes to try it. So I was so happy that when I had to go because of my other careers, that James Brown replaced me. Ah, that's James Brown. You got a Harvard guy to replace the Amherst guy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And and I uh, had the opportunity uh, to become a broadcaster uh, at the highest level, uh, covering the National Football League. Uh, you paired with another former player for a good deal of time with uh, with Dan Deardorf. Uh, I just my biggest question about Dan Deardorf: Did Bo Schembechler was he still calling him for bed check when you guys were covering NFL games? Oh, man, I thought he was an assistant Michigan coach. I asked him, was he on the payroll? I mean, I had to learn so much about Michigan just to be with Dan. What a great guy. What a great opportunity. You know, we didn't always have the best schedule, but we had the yep. best production team led by uh, uh, our producer, David Dinkins Jr. And mm -hmm. one game that is noticeable that I like to talk about is we had the Green Bay at Tampa Bay game. And this had to be 80 whatever, because uh, we, every week they show you what percent of the company country you have. Hmm. We had like 4% of yes. the country. <laughs> For the Battle of the Bays. Yeah, because Tampa Bay, that Tampa Bay wasn't sold out. So yep. nobody at Tampa Blacked Bay. Blacked out, sold out. yep. Right? It was a black out there, and then in green, so we had all the Green Bay, and then the Bears were playing or something. So that, that's all we had was Milwaukee. So anyway, I was very relaxed, and and I was trying to come up with something witty that would be in USA Today the next day. You know, few get said, whatever. So I'm just cruising <laughs> along, and this is back when uh, Steve Young was on Tampa Bay. So the game goes into overtime. And CBS contract says that uh, 60 minutes has to start the same at every market. 
So yeah. that's why all the games dump into the last game. That Heidi right. and all that. So they keep going from game to game to game. Because so, we're the only game in overtime. We go into a commercial, and then somebody in the air says, okay, when we come back, we're going to be on national TV. What? <laughs> Everybody's watching. Yeah, I'm on 4%. I'm relaxed. I'm telling jokes and stuff. Now I'm on national. I mean, this is, I mean, Bernie, that's your dream. Yeah. Bernie, I'm saying if I could just come up with this one thing, if I can. Oh, just, one know, gem, one out. nugget. They, yeah, one nugget, exactly. Yep. So the energy just goes up in the, in the booth, right? <laughs> so we come out of the break, and Deardorff is rolling. And then he stops. And I'm supposed to jump in. I didn't say anything. And then he started again. Okay, second down. <laughs> Finally, he starts kicking me. And he goes, oh, and he kicks me. I said, "Yeah, good play." <laughs> it was like network, you know that movie. I'm going, "Oh my god!" You know what happened? A big chance to be on national TV, and I don't know what to say. Yeah, you that suddenly, was, that was so much fun. suddenly you were you were uh, Bob Uecker's yeah. the, the partner in Major League that never says a word. Best right. color man in the business. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. I got nothing for you. Uh, all, all part of your uh, your post NFL uh, journey, Gene, and uh, get back to the fact that you know you uh, you got the law degree uh, in the off season in Washington, and uh, you had a chance to join your older brother uh, Reginald, and uh, that led to an opportunity that, well, you know, once again, the twist of fate in your life, uh, both business and, and, uh, and family because of the, the, the time you shared with Reginald, you were suddenly thrust into a position that you probably never thought that you were going to be in at, at that time. Well, it took about 20 years. I mean, my, some of my earliest memories were sitting on his bed waiting for him to come home from school. And then, of course, you know, in subsequent years, you know, my other brothers and sisters were born. But I just remember still a time when it was just he and I and mom and dad and uh, can you imagine, I didn't have to go past my kitchen table to get darn good advice. Because I was lucky I had a mom and a dad. And then, of course, Reg. So he uh, went to uh, Dunbar High School in East Baltimore and went to Virginia State. And then he talked his way into a summer program at the Harvard Law School. And it was a program for juniors when he was actually a senior. But he talked his way, somehow he got in, it, and he did so well, the dean said, apply next year, and you have a good chance of attending. So he came back to Baltimore, and he got a job. And I'll never forget the day that the dean called, that one phone in the kitchen, and the dean asked him, can you get here? And uh, we put him on the train at Penn Station. He goes up, I guess, to South Station. South and, Station. Uh, gets off the train with a suitcase. And we argued whether he had 50 or or $100 burning. But he would go on and be so grateful that he would contribute the largest single gift in the history of Harvard Law School. And the day the Harvard International Law Library is named after my brother, uh, Reginald F. Lewis. So when they give the tour, they say he's the only person to attend the school that got in without applying. So I was taking some friends on a tour. And the tour guide said, Mr. Thiegel, is that really true? How do we know that he got in without actually applying? And I said, the way we know is that when he got off the train and came in, the first thing they asked him to do was fill out an application. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's proof positive. <laughs> yeah, isn't that a good story? Oh, that's tremendous. So, uh, and I was very happy to be on the board of visitors at the law school. And during those years, I had Justice Ginsburg on one side of me. Justice Kagan on the other, Bernie. Bernie, wow. I'm sitting in a meeting. I, I didn't want to open my mouth. <laughs> you thought you were back with Dan Deardorff again. Oh, nothing my, nothing exactly. to say. <laughs> and it was just an honor because my brother had passed and he made the contribution. So they uh, let a guy with a GW degree go be on the Harvard Board of Visitors. Wow. And, and you lost your brother uh, very suddenly and very tragically the brain cancer in 1993 and uh, that put you in a position now of 
oh, by the way, being the CEO of a billion dollar company, uh, some perspective, if you will, reflecting on that experience, which not too many people would be able to relate to, but we want to hear what it was like for you suddenly to be uh, the head of Beatrice Foods at that time. Well, unfortunately, we saw it coming because <clears throat> my brother's health was deteriorating. <clears throat> and when I think back, it was like uh, that scene in The Godfather where Michael is talking to Marlon Brando and the tomato thing. Mm. It's him telling him, watch out for Tessio and yep. these are the people are going to come after you. Because we had outright 51% of this international company. But 49% were owned by unknown individuals that acquired the stock at the time of the acquisition. And we didn't know who they were, even though uh, they were represented, you know, by a board seat or whatever. But many times they were hostile, and it was very clear that they would try to seize control somehow by either finding me unfit and try to force an election or or what have you. There's all kinds of corporate uh, shenanigans that they had already tried by suing us and threatening lawsuits. So my brother had planned for all this, and he first planned for my security. So he decided to put a person in charge of my security who my job was to try to convince him to take my job. My job was to get this person who's going to look after me to take my job. So we buried my brother in Baltimore. And then the next day, the first day I became chairman, I went to see that person. And at that time, he was the chief of, he was uh, what, Secretary of Defense. What was he? Colin Powell was the, uh, what was he, chief of staff? Hmm. Yep. So I go over there to the, Pentagon <laughs> and, and see him and, and all the military supporting him. And he's thinking about retiring. So I said, look, you, you know, boom, boom, boom. Well, of course, he went on to become Secretary of State. Right. So he had set up security for me in Europe, and he said that I'm a strategic asset and that the French are going to want to know where I sleep every night, and I'm going to be followed and recorded because I control over 30% of the food in the city of Paris with 207 supermarkets that we control inside the Paris Beltway in 1993. Wow. My brother didn't tell it to me like that. <laughs> and so yeah. I leave from there going to the first place because I got to go. We, we originally had 40 some businesses <clears throat> in 30 countries. It had melted down to about 19 in eight countries. So I'm on the plane going to the very first stop. And where would that happen to be where we had the most trouble at the time? An ice cream plant in Verona, Italy. Hmm. So I fly overnight nonstop from uh, USA to Verona. And I'm met by the uh, owner of the plant. So as we drive through, he uh, he says, uh, uh, this is uh, where the Capulets live. Oh, I said, oh, you mean Romeo and Juliet? He was so impressed that I knew about Verona. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day we have a meeting, and he says, I need a raise in the budget. And my lawyer jumped up. My conciliary said, Gene, go to the bathroom. Come back in 15 minutes. I come back in 15 minutes, they're talking about something else. So later, I said, what was that about? They said, oh, we didn't tell you. At the end of the year, you have to sign a tax form saying we didn't bribe anybody. I said, well, we didn't bribe anybody, did we? He said, no, of course not. But it just so happens that the mafia controlled the only gas station within 30 miles. He has 100 trucks, and he wanted to increase in the budget so that he could still make his bonus. And we didn't think you should deliberate on that. <laughs> so that night I go back to the hotel room and finally take my tie off. And there's a knock on the door. And it's my vice president of uh, ice cream operations. We had six ice cream companies. Uh, at the time, it was eight before I sold to them. 
and he said, uh, oh, we just had an explosion at the plant in Puerto Rico. I said, did anybody get hurt? He says, I don't think so. So I said, what am I supposed to do? He said, nothing. It's just my duty to inform you. And that was my first day on the job. <laughs> oh, it's all within That's 24 hours. Being the chairman of International Food Company. <laughs> And, and you did that for a while. You, you were with uh, you were with Beatrice Foods before uh, you moved on to some other endeavors. But uh, the sum total of that experience, I'm sure, has uh, carried you well in uh, some of your other initiatives. I mean, uh, that would that would prepare you for almost anything that you could possibly encounter on, on the road. Oh yeah, no, it was it was challenging, but it also had its benefits because I learned about living in Paris and my French a lot better. Mm. And uh, you yeah, founded the uh, the TLC group. Uh, look at, looking at some of the other uh, credits and and uh, some of the other companies that you've been involved with. Uh, also, a partner in a law firm in Baltimore. Uh, partner in Fanphone, a European company. Director, vice chairman of uh, McCall, uh, a management company. Uh, so. Uh, quite a diversity in terms of uh, your career in in, uh, in business, Gene. Anything in particular that uh, that has stood out as uh, maybe uh, the one that has been the most compelling for you, or the most rewarding as you look oh, at uh, the sum of the parts? Say, but, you just, yeah, you, but boy, you reminded me about fan phone. I smuggled a, a, a 386 chip in the France, <laughs> and I was able to plug my modem up to France Telecom. Mm -hmm. And I had the first voicemail in France. Pussy a un, pussy a deux, pussy a I was the first one because I tried to get a deal with French Telecom and they said, no, we'll develop it ourselves. So I took an off the shelf telephony product and brought a computer in storage, in luggage. Yep. 386 chip. How long ago was that? A 386 chip. Plug that baby in. And that was, that was my first French company. That was after I got out of Beatrice. That was that was that was after after the uh, the beach the Beatrice experience back in France yeah. once again the road the road leading back to France, and uh, have been very active uh, as a a former player. You're past president of uh, the retired player steering committee. Uh, also, uh, have been a, a legal legal counsel and advisor uh, for a number of uh, Wall Street investment services. Uh, managing director of a uh, of a uh, of Avum uh, Capital Partnership, uh, just going down the list, it goes goes on and on. Uh, as far as the NFL and the role and the many roles that you've had uh, with the NFL, as you look at the state of the game today and pandemic notwithstanding, you've been a real advocate for the players of the past and the, the players currently in terms of really going back to the early days of being able to take care of the players' safety and to make the safety a priority in a, in a game that obviously is, is violent and dangerous on a good day? Well, we've had to go from a time when the uh, people who own the teams looked at us as cattle as opposed to as, as human uh, They're trying to uh, make some steps in that regard. And just by the steps that the commissioner has made this year, and recognizing, you know, uh, some of the issues and that we can't be, uh, you can't separate us from the fabric of America. I mean, hell, we are America. I mean, football yeah. is what made this country great. I mean, do you know that World War II was the war between football players and soccer players? Do you know over 85% of American soldiers played high school football? And they knew how to be a team and how to work together. And we're going to war against people that go one-on-one -on -one playing soccer. They didn't have a chance. <laughs> it's uniquely American. Yep. And yeah. tested us. It's a test. Mental, physical, intellectual, emotional. All of that it takes. There's no such thing as a dumb, good football player. No such thing. I, so it, the, the opportunity to uh, help other people to become part of causes you know, larger than yourself, and of course being an athlete, it gives you the stage and the platform 
in which we weren't even encouraged to speak for ourselves. I mean, Vince Lombardi fired the first guy that got an agent. Yeah, Jim Ringo. Yeah, bye, boom. Mm-hmm. So that's where we were coming from, okay? Very American, okay? Mm-hmm. So we're making progress, we're coming forward. So now we need to get diversity in the ownership ranks. That We got to keep going. Oh, yeah. I was the first person to prove I Major League Baseball. And uh, P, uh, Mr. Angelos outbid me, and I did not have enough money to buy the Orioles that year. <laughs> and that would have been something because we were looking, and now, of course, we do have minorities participating in baseball, and the same has to happen in football. So progress has been made, but still a long way down the road that still has to be navigated would be your assessment. I think so. And you mentioned about the Orioles, and uh, well, that would have added to uh, your own Hollywood story, if you will, if that had happened. <laughs> yeah, uh, that he went. Yeah, but I couldn't focus on that. Gee whiz, I had my hands full with this other company, and my brother had uh, taken a look at it. We were already in the deal, so I just felt that we had already, you know, you know gotten that far. To see how far we could get, and that's as far as I got. Mm-hmm. Would have been quite a story, though, from roving food vendor part-time groundskeeper, and summer intern to owning the team. I mean, that, that, that's one that uh, Hollywood would have been primed for. Yeah, the groundskeeper was a lot better than selling those sodas, man. Those bees follow you around the whole stadium. <laughs> you have that syrup on yourself. But being there, sitting there, hoping that it doesn't rain and getting paid for that, that's pretty good. Yeah, this is not, not bad. And uh, also... Uh, your recollection of uh, a guy that I had, I don't know if I'll call it the pleasure to interview. It was an experience, uh, was uh, Hall of Fame manager, the cantankerous Earl Weaver. And uh, so goes the story. You were up around the press box, uh, delving into stats. You were, you know, pretty deep into baseball. Uh, that Earl actually consulted some of those stats back in 1969, the Orioles uh, American League pennant winning season. Is that true? Well, it was, uh, yeah, it was the 1970 season. The season oh, 70. Cincinnati. Yes. And, uh, uh, I had a summer job with the Orioles, and half the job was in the PR department, getting balls signed, et cetera. And then the other half was in the farm department. And my hmm. farm department job was keeping the statistics for Earl Wheeler. Now, this is pre computer really pre photocopy. And Earl Weaver kept one piece of paper for every American League pitcher. And it was somebody's job after the Orioles played that pitcher to do the cumulatives and to update it. So that when we was going to face a pitcher, he had a page from previous performances. And he knew who did well. So as fate would have, you know how the schedule falls. So we were finished playing on West. And we're finishing up playing the East, the Yankees, you know, Red Sox. So I said, okay, I'll finish these and send them back. And they weren't thinking. They're in the pennant race. And they let me leave with the Orioles' intellectual property. I didn't even make a photocopy of it. I had all the originals for the Western Division team. And I had the uh, scorebook. So you take the scorebook and you do the cumulus. So, of course, I get back from football practice. That stuff goes into a closet. Not to be seen again until I get a call from Bob Brown. Now, you know, Bob Brown was the PR man. Harry Dalton was the general manager, and they both went to Amherst College. So that's how I got that job. I'll just be honest about that. Not that I was especially qualified. But anyway. It was an international search. So I did become the father of cyber metrics because Bob called me and wanted to know who hit well against Lynn McLaughlin, who had gotten traded from, I think, the Angels to the Cincinnati Reds. And the answer was Chico Simone. Ah. Chico had gone seven for nine. So Chico gets the pinch hit, the game goes extra innings, the Orioles win, they win the series, four to one. And my first mention in Sports Illustrated was in a sports card, a front and it's oh, yeah. Earl Weaver, this little brainy kid from Amherst. And I'm a little brainy kid. Father of Sabermetrics. You got the exclusive right here, Brandon. <laughs> exactly. The father of Sabermetrics. That's right. On the games people play, we got that exclusive. <laughs> Another game that you played and played well. 
And uh, if, if you did acquire the Orioles, uh, well, you know, one, one guy would have been able to knock on your door at negotiation time and say, hey, Dad, uh, you know, for a long time, Oriole, well, your son in law is, uh, is, is uh, got a little bit of a connection to the Orioles. Yeah, well, he's one of the greatest Orioles ever to play. I mean, I, I, mean, I guess he might agree with that maybe Frank Robinson was the greatest, but uh, at least the ones that I've seen. But he was uh, had such a great career, but he just meant even more than Frank did to the community, especially at a time when, uh, you know, a leading voice was, was needed uh, with responsibility and, and leadership and to be able to show it uh, every day through his performance. And, you know, of course, I told my daughter she didn't want to be hanging out with athletes. I mean, look, look how I turned out. But <laughs> it's a Mary and Adam Jones, yeah. Right. And... Uh, and they're happily married in over in Japan. Japan, yeah. Where Adam is now playing for the Oryx Buffaloes. Mm -hmm. That's right, over, over in Japan uh, currently. And uh, when we, we talked a couple of weeks ago, and uh, you brought up what I think would be, uh, you know, count me in on this one, Gene. Put me in, Coach. Uh, I do the, gladly do the research about honoring the first black player from every college around the country. And uh, we exchanged a couple of stories about uh, that experience and, and the breaking of the color line in football, a story that you recounted uh, back to uh, your beloved Colts and my beloved Giants uh, going back to 1959 and uh, an exhibition game at the Cotton Bowl. And you talk about how far we've come, how far we still have to go. But uh, I thought that was a story to, that uh, if you could recount that story about the Colts and the Giants playing that exhibition game, rematch of that championship game back in, in Dallas and uh, what happened to uh, some members of, the, of the, uh, the Colts in terms of being able to play in that game. Well, that story was told to me uh, by one of the greatest uh, players and one of my greatest heroes of all time, a man by the name of Lenny Moore, who uh, was number 24 for the uh, Baltimore Colts for Defense State. University is famous for his stats, started as a wide receiver, finished as a running back, and continues to be a community leader in, in the city of uh, Baltimore. And we had a chance to spend the day doing some charitable activities. And I believe that this is in his book, but I can't recall the title of his book. But he talks about the uh, preseason game played by the New York football giants and the Baltimore Colts the year after the greatest game ever played in 58 were the NFL championship. And this was a time when both the AFL and the NFL were competing for cities and they were trying to move to the South and particularly Dallas. So they established a preseason game to be at the Cotton Bowl, 1959 Dallas, except they didn't tell the Baltimore Colts that the uh, Dallas was segregated in 1959 and that the team would not be able to stay in the same hotel Indeed, when the plane landed in left field, the black players would have to stay on the plane and go down to the end of the tarmac uh, to catch a bus to go over to the black hotel. So they tell the story about how they went over there. <clears throat> and when the Giants heard about it, there's a very famous, famous player on the Giants who had gone to SMU who took his teammate and the guy was white. And he says, I'm going to go stick with the black players. And his name was Kyle Rowe. Hmm. And he was never forgiven by his people at SMU in Dallas before he had gone to college. And he goes to New York, becomes a very famous broadcaster. And when he died, so many black former players showed up that Kyle Jr. had to ask because nobody had ever told him how his father had stood with us. In 1959, Bernie, and it wasn't popular. That's right. Not certainly not at that that point. Not in Dallas, Texas. No, not in not in Dallas, Texas at that great time. Yeah, absolutely. Kyle testament, Rowe. testament to Kyle Rochin. Um, I went and checked this out after we talked about it. Fourteen former Giant teammates named sons Kyle that he played. With. You know, that, I think that's that, that's a testament to the man. That's that's pretty extraordinary to the uh, to, to the, the guy that he was. You know, he was, yeah. In, 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 indeed, indeed, the case. And uh, as you look at uh, 
at uh, the current state of affairs in the nation. We're certainly in some very challenging and some troubled times. I, w I have to ask your take, I mean, who more qualified than you uh, about what is going on now in terms of socially and, uh, and in terms of uh, race relations and uh, what we've seen with the Black Lives Matter movement, et cetera, as far as your thoughts, and I'm sure that you've, you've given some thought to it in terms of uh, what we're faced with in particular at this time. Well, there's been so much that's uh, been suppressed in this country. And you talk about you see it today and how they suppress the vote and how they don't want to count everybody in the census, these kinds of exclusionary things. And, and we've tried to be an in, inclusive in country, but somewhere we forgot that we were a country of Native Americans, former enslaved Americans, and immigrants. Every one of us, every family, ain't one family that didn't, wasn't one of the three. Mm -hmm. And the way it happened wasn't the best way of happening. There was a lot of pain and suffering. And what can you do about it now? Well, number one, you can recognize it. Number two, you can learn about it. And then you, then you can begin to have a reconciliation. They tried to do that in South Africa. They actually had a reconciliation commission where apologies uh, were extended for what happened. I mean, but there are things that happened in my lifetime and in a lot of people's lifetimes that you just remember and, and it just leaves a bad feeling or better. And, and you just got to get over it. But it'll be a lot better getting over it knowing that my children won't have to worry about it. And certainly my grandchildren won't. And that's what we're fighting for right now. For subsequent generations. Generations to come. And I, yep, we're all going to get in good trouble. And that, exactly. That's a, Mr. Lewis, that's right. Good trouble. It, it, right. A little more good trouble would go a long way. And uh, once again, you mentioned as a, a country of, of immigrants as we, uh, as we wind it down. Uh, your particular story, you did a little uh, genealogical uh, research, uh, which be became quite telling in terms of your own family story. And well, you, you quoted Romeo and Juliet. Do you mind if I go back there? What's in a name uh, from Romeo and Juliet? Your name is Jean Schloss Fugit. And uh, you did a little bit of research on that some years back. And you found an extraordinary American story, which fits with what you just alluded to in terms of we're all immigrants when we go back and we track and we trace in terms of our own personal genealogical and family stories. That we'll, there, there's a unity of that. Well, that was one of my earliest uh, curiosities when you asked me about journalism. And I told you I like to read and I was curious. And one of my earliest curiosities was the fact of my name, J-E-A-N-S-C-H-L-O-S-S-F-U-G-E-T-T, -S -S -E -T -T, Jr. And it would be years later that I would find out that Fugit was a, a name derived from F-U-G-I-T-T, -T, the slave owner of a plantation near Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And that my grandfather's father was freed from that plantation during Grant's march to Vicksburg when his mother told him and his older brother to go with the soldiers because she was too old to walk day and night. And they would go with the soldiers night and day and night and day until they walked their way to freedom. And the young Joseph Fugit was adopted by uh, a doctor who was in the New York Regiment and took him up to Baldwinsville, New York, outside of Syracuse, where he built a home on the canal. And he married a woman that lived on the Indian reservation and they had five children and all five first generation from slavery went to college. So my grandfather was 1912 Cornell and he gets a letter from Booker T. Washington where he goes to Tuskegee to teach a town at 10. And while there, he met my grandmother, Hazel Schloss. Hazel Schloss's family 
was on George Washington's plantation in Mount Vernon. And when the stepson died, freed the slaves, and they went as far west as they could to Kentucky. And then my grandmother's mother later went to Kansas, which was the best place to be, because that's where John Brown was from. And there was right. no yeah, abolitionist was slave in Kansas. Hmm. Well, my grandmother was born in Kansas. She graduates in 1913 from the University of Kansas to Dr. Naya Smith. Hmm. And she gets a letter from Booker T. Washington, and she ends up at Tuskegee, Alabama, and then met my grandfather, and they got married. So they ended up in Westchester, Pennsylvania, <clears throat> where my grandfather was the principal for over 40 consecutive years, and today there's a Joseph R. Fugit Middle School in Western Westchester, Pennsylvania. Hmm. There's our American story on the games people play. I'm glad that you had the opportunity to recount that. Just that's a remarkable yeah, story. Yeah, let me just add that that slave uh, married uh, uh, a Bakeman, B-A-K-E-M-A-N, and she had descended from Henry Bakeman, Bakeman, who was a free black man who fought in the Revolutionary War. So I'm in the Sons of the American Revolution. <laughs> that, that, that's right. That actually uh, fought in... Uh, in battles in uh, in upstate New York, he was only 16 years old when he, when he was fighting in the Revolutionary War. That's right. Well, we, we have a way of doing things when we're young in our family. I was going to say, he skipped a couple of grades, too. Only he had the British shooting at him. God bless him. <laughs> Absolutely. Gene, thanks so much. Uh, this, is, this has been, uh, really, this has been a, just a, a great, great honor to have the opportunity to talk to you. And, and once again, I'm going to stand by my intro here in the games people play, Renaissance Man, and uh, I just have to ask you, you're, you're, you're in Baltimore, and uh, what is uh, your focus uh, currently in terms of endeavors and initiatives uh, um, at, at uh, this point uh, in time for you? Well, I've moved out west now. I'm uh, out in Arizona now. Okay. I'm yep. establishing a law practice here and uh, working on my memoirs. Uh -huh. Well, I think they're going to be pretty extensive and compelling would be well, my thanks, guess. Ernie. I'm going to look forward to seeing you in person, and, and uh, I want to come up and eat some of that food where you are. <laughs> Absolutely. You're, you're invited. You're cordially invited to the fours, and uh, I think my, my executive producer and I are going to have a lobster roll right now, so we'd love to have you oh, with us. Oh, you a, would have to mention that. A virtual lobster roll is all we can do right now in the pandemic. <laughs> so right, you well, played very well. I appreciate it. It was really kind of you. Absolutely. God bless you. Played well here in the games people play today. Thanks very much, Gene. All right. Thank you, Bernie. Gene Fugit, our guest uh, here today. And uh, once again, many, many thanks to Gene for joining us. Uh, that was uh, that was some extraordinary time that we just uh, we just spent with. Once again, I'll stand by a true renaissance man. Uh, thank you to the fours. Uh, they allowed us uh, to uh, come back here once again today. Uh, to the, the Fords, the number one sports bar and restaurant in the United States. If you're in the area uh, around Boston, please uh, stop in and see Peter Colton and all the good folks here. Uh, also, again, uh, thank you, uh, Phil Castanetti at Sports World on Route 1, uh, not too far from where we are here in Boston. Uh, Kirsten Kelly uh, for all the help that uh, she's giving us in our launch here over the first uh, several weeks. With the games people play, to my executive producer, Andy Bernstein, and uh, thank you to him. He was getting excited with all the Baltimore talk here, which is uh, certainly uh, deep in his, uh, his roots. And uh, thank you uh, once again uh, to uh, everybody on the, uh, on the West Coast, uh, our uh, Seattle crew with Todd and Key One. So for the games people play, this is Bernie Corbett saying, play the game well. See you next time.